So next, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Lisa Schubitz, who's a research scientist at the University of Arizona Valley Fever Center for Excellence. Madam. Hi. First of all, thank you to the committee for inviting me to talk about the Delta CPS-1 to prevent valley fever in dogs. And I'm presenting this as a One Health journey from plants to humans, assuming I can work the electronics. So my disclosure is that I'm listed on the patent for the CPS-1 vaccine. And I wanted to start with acknowledgments and preface this talk with the fact that many people and organizations contributed to driving this project forward and getting it off the ground. I like to call this the vaccine that dog owners made because the preliminary data that allowed us to progress to the point that we are uh, occurred because dog owners and dog clubs, kennel clubs, agility clubs, obedience clubs, donated money to the Valley, the Canine Valley Fever Project at the Valley Fever Center for a couple of years. And then in one year, we raised $40,000 for this, and it allowed us to really do the mouse studies with CPS-1 that had been sort of, we thought it was great, but it was sort of languishing in the lab. And then on the right are all of the um, departments and places and Antivive Life Sciences and NIH have really funded this once we got this preliminary data going and submitted the grant. So it was plant pathologists that discovered that CPS1 is a virulence factor in plant, in plant pathogens. And the corn pathogen, Cochleobulus heterostrophus, with the CPS1 gene knocked out of it, had greatly reduced virulence on the corn plants. So Dr. Mark Orbach's lab knocked out this CPS1 homolog in Coccidioides posidaceae, and we use strain Silvera as our laboratory strain. So when I say posidaceae for the rest of this talk, we're talking about um, strain Silvera as the parental strain for this. And the removal of the 6 kilobase gene was accomplished, and a hygromycin cassette was added. And this allowed us to be able to grow it on media that we could identify it and differentiate it from our parental strain if we had mixed cultures, which you get if you vaccinate. We learned that this is profoundly avirulent in mice, and we did most of the very early work in two different strains of susceptible mice, both C57 black 6 and Balb C mice, at doses ranging from 50, which is a lethal dose with strain Silvera, up to 10,000. And we worked with this almost exclusively, giving these things intranasally. We cared about pneumonia, um, which is the way it normally enters. And in the vast majority of these mice, we couldn't detect even a trace of this fungus by 28 days after we gave a dose of this intranasally. We looked histopathologically. We did fungal growth studies. So it appeared to be quite avirulent in normal mice. And when we started to think about uh, the possibility of taking this into humans, we did some immunodeficient mice. And nod skids are very immunodeficient. They're lacking all lymphoid origins and some signaling. They have a gamma receptor deficiency as well. And we didn't. Um, do these mice long term, but we, we gave them a thousand spores, which again is, you know, 50 times a lethal dose at least, and monitored them for 14 days and they remained clinically normal. I expected them to die, but they looked great. And we did histopathology on these NSG mice and Bell C mice at really early time points. And the picture on the right shows that CPS1 looks like it kind of degrades by day three, day four. It's surrounded by neutrophils. The walls are thin and irregular, and this one's broken. It's filled with neutrophils. And this, um, so it partially undergoes replication in the mouse. It starts to become a spherule, but it's not very replication competent in the animal. And this has important safety implications when we talk about taking this into dogs or humans as a live vaccine. So we did several vaccination studies in both strains of mice that showed that it's highly protective. And some of these were fungal burden studies, and some of them were short-term survival studies. 
But one of the things we learned along the way, because we asked, well, you know, there are problems with viable vaccines, potentially, maybe it protects if it's dead. And it doesn't protect if it's dead. And that wasn't really shocking in light of the fact that it takes tons of formalin-killed spherules to make mice immune, what, three grams, 2.8 grams, I mean, a lot. So this wasn't really shocking. We're working with low doses, around 10,000 spores given intranasally, <clears throat> make mice really immune. So this graph shows that only the viable spores generate this protective immunity. Finally, in really talking about going forward with this as a vaccine, and now that we had NIH money, we did some longer-term studies to look at duration of immunity and extended survival, and we demonstrated both. The graph on the left shows both that these are C57 black six mice live all of them lived six months after we vaccinated them and then challenged them intranasally with 100 spores of Silvera. And then we also challenged these mice. Half of the mice got this Coxidiotes imitus strain, or species, and the other half got uh, strain Silvera. And you can see that there's equal protection against both species of Coxidiotes, which was expected, but it's also very important to know that for sure. And all the controls were dead by day 23, so there's no real difference in the virulence in this model between the imidus or the post -dossii. Next, we wanted to know, well, you know, maybe if you challenge them a month after you vaccinate them, it's good, but, you know, the, it, the immunity wanes. And what we showed with this viable vaccine is that over six months, the immunity does not wane. We infected groups of mice at two months, four months, and six months. And this was a short-term fungal burden study, so we measured lung fungal burden at 14 days after intranasal challenge. And you can see there's, there's zero difference between the protection at two months and the protection at four months. So we applied for an NIH grant. We answered an RFA. And one of the stipulations of this grant was that we had to have a commercial partner, and there needed to be a deliverable from this grant. So Antivive Life Sciences stepped up and purchased licensing rights to this vaccine and jumped in with all four feet into the deep end of the pool. And we've been on a very wild ride since then. So the objective of the NIH grant was we had to have a canine vaccine ready to progress to USD licensing and they also said, oh, by the way, you can have the money, but can you do it in four years instead of five? And we said, well, of course. Um, it's been five years, but hey, you don't tell them no. Uh, you work harder. <laughs> so anyway, and then this was to be proof of concept with demonstration of both safety and efficacy in, in a target animal species that's not a mouse as a stepping stone to developing this vaccine for humans. So we got some dogs. It's more complicated than that, but we'll keep it simple. We, we got young adult dogs. We started with 34 of them. They were randomized <clears throat> and vaccinated. So at every step, these animals were randomized. There wasn't any selection bias. We had male and female dogs. Nothing was neutered. They were all intact. We had one bitch come in heat during the project, and that was the only thing we saw. And they were given two doses. Three of the groups were given two doses of the CPS-1 vaccine, 28 days apart, at 10,000, 50,000, or 100,000 of the live spores. One group got only a prime at the highest dose, and our controls got saline. The dogs experienced no systemic adverse effects from the vaccine. They were looked at every day. And about two-thirds of them experienced mild to moderate and transient injection site swelling. It was soft, and it resolved by two weeks post-booster. So by 42 days, these dogs didn't have any um, outward evidence that we'd vaccinated them. It turns out they didn't have any typical inward evidence either. Uh, measuring antibody response is one of the easiest and most common ways to determine whether they might have made an immune response to the vaccine, and using commercial Enzyme immunoassay and immunodiffusion, both of which are actually used to diagnose coxie in dogs, 
we detected antibody to the vaccine in only three out of the 34 dogs. Recently, so this study was done in 2019, but we've got lots of serum frozen. We went back and started to look at this because we still would like a surrogate test for this. And looking at, um, at using the CPS1 vaccine, reacting it against the serum, and then putting a fluorescent marker on it and doing flow cytometry. And if you measure this all together over time, so you're measuring the accumulation of fluorescent antibody on CPS1 particles, um, you can see that if you look at the area under the curve over that 42 days, there's, um, the, the, we are getting an antibody response, but it's small and it's not going to interfere with diagnosis. So we moved 30 of these animals to Colorado State University and infected them with 10,000 spores by um, a, a very cool aerosol challenge model that distributes it widely and deeply in the lungs. And this was, it turned out to be, we knew it was because we'd done a model. It's a non-lethal infection. It's, in fact, primarily subclinical, but it produces very significant um, indicators, measurable indicators of disease. So these are the results. The full results are published in the manuscript that's shown on there, and it's easily searched, and I can't go deeply into them. But we had only two dogs in the whole study that exhibited any signs of clinical illness, and only one of them you would have taken to a veterinarian. We measured a composite total disease score to assess what was going on, and this include lung fungal burden, um, blood proteins, um, immunodiffusion titers, blinded histopathologic and radiographic evaluation. These are examples of the final lung x-rays. On the left is a dog that received a prime boost. In the middle is a dog that received a primary vaccination, only demonstrating uh, an enlarged hyalur lymph node at the big arrow. And the dog on the right is a control dog demonstrating a really big hyalur lymph node as well as um, caudal lung lobe pneumonia, like Dr. Sykes showed you yesterday. So in a nutshell, all three of the prime plus boost dose groups had very low composite disease scores, and they weren't different from each other. A primary vaccination only doesn't protect the dogs adequately, and the control dogs had really high burdens, and the statistically significant protection of the prime boost dogs compared to uh, the control and the prime only. This slide I included, um, Ed Robb made these slides for a talk he gave recently at the Vaccines R&D meeting. And they provide a, um, an overview of where, you know, where, we had, where we came from and where we had to go and what our regulatory issues might be. But what I really want to focus on is uh, go to this next slide where we've got this in it. And then on the, on the left is his, uh, what he called his update three, and all these boxes are checked, showing that we've worked through a lot of the issues that we needed to. We've shown immunogenicity, we've shown efficacy in the target species. This is necessary for licensing by the USDA. And we're working on getting this licensed, engaged with the CVB to get it to, to work on licensing. So a key objective of this, again, I want to reiterate, was that the, we get a vaccine going towards humans. And to that end, VFC, E, and Anavive have worked with um, Crozet Biopharma to try to move this toward humans. They had a sub-licensing option that was dependent upon funding, but they haven't gotten any yet. And then this vaccine does address a clear unmet medical need, but it requires an infusion of funding and some human health partners to move it forward. But the people working on this, Anavive and Crozet and the VFCE, are um, completely committed to continuing this. Thank you.